We are going to show you how to teach at home. I am going to show you a miracle puzzle. Before I round things out with an endless canvas and a lot of note taking. Oh, be still my heart. Could it be time? Yes, it is. iOS today. today. iOS today comes to you from Twit's LastPass Studios. You're focused on security. But are your employees LastPass can ensure they are by making access and authentication seamless, whether they're working in the office or remotely. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of iOS Today is brought to you by LastPass. Prepare for the unexpected in your business with LastPass, trusted by over 17 million users and 61,000 businesses worldwide. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you. And by Mint Mobile. They provide the same premium network coverage you're used to, but at a fraction of the cost because everything's online. Mint Mobile makes it easy to cut your wireless bill down to just $15 a month with their three-month introductory plan. Plus, get the plan shipped to your door free at mintmobile.com slash iOS. I want to hear that accent you did on Catch the Hacker. <laughs> Holy cow. No. Uh, uh, Stephanie Studebaker. Is that who you're talking about? <laughs> yeah, uh, Stephanie. Yeah. Uh, Stephan I say Stephanie Studebaker. <laughs> From corporate. <laughs> I, I thought, yeah, yeah. This was our uh, our uh, Friday uh, after hours. It was a fun version of Werewolf where you're trying to catch a hacker. I won't spoil it for you by telling you who the hacker was, but it was a surprise. Let's put it that way. Yes. And you were the moderator, Stephanie Studebaker from Corporate. <laughs> oh, boy. It was I, very know, it was funny. Fun. It was cute. It was so Yeah, good. well, I, I, I had not played uh, Werewolf except the day before we did a little so, trial to make sure that things were going to go well. Yeah, it is a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. You need a large group, though. We had a large group, a lot of great people yeah. playing. So that's on our uh, our YouTube feed if you want to take a look at that. And here's Stephanie Studebaker. I'm always <laughs> careful about accents because I don't think I could sustain them as you did for an hour. I usually find <laughs> that my accents migrate. Yeah, normally in shows, I don't uh, end up having to keep them for very long yeah. for that one, you know, Ooh, you playing the challenge. role. Yeah, so. you did it. You you got into it. You embodied Stephanie Studebaker. I, I did my best, I'll tell you. So um, today, put on your mortar board. By the way, congratulations more. to all the graduates mm -hmm. who are unfortunately mm -hmm. not getting a walk this month. But uh, there are a lot of people studying at home now. There are, yeah. And uh, a lot of parents sort of having to fill in the gaps with helping to teach kids how to yeah. study, uh, or teach kids, you know, what, what, whatever the work has to be. In fact, uh, my co-host on Tech News Weekly, Jason Howell, has often talked about oh, uh, being, a, being a teacher yeah. uh, at home for his, his two his little girls. girls. Yeah, it's yeah. tough. It's a lot of work for parents who aren't used to doing this. Uh, and, and, you know, they changed math. <laughs> I yeah. don't know how many times I hear that. Yeah. I hear that more than anything else. Yeah. Apparently, they've changed math, uh, yeah. the, the way that math is is uh, learned. And so, you know, I, I kind of I empathized to the best of my ability and said, I think it might be good to do an episode where we talk about how to help your your kids or whomever you might be teaching at home, uh, how to help them and, and how to teach them and maybe to sort of refresh yourself on some of those concepts. Because there are times where, you know, I'll pull out a, a, an equation to try and figure out some measurements for a project that I'm working on. But it's not often that I'm sitting there doing, you know, word problems and things like that. So uh, a refresher on how that all worked uh, seemed to be a, a great way to to you know, go forth with this episode of iOS today. And as it turns out, the iPad is really a great tool for this. I hope you have iPads at home uh, that you can uh, let the kids use for uh, for teaching. Yeah, uh, for or learning. iPhones, you know, yeah. iPod Touches even. And we should iPod probably, touches even. it might even be worth starting by telling people how you can pin an app. 
so that when you give, this is a problem for uh, younger kids, when you give them the iPad, they're not tempted to launch Netflix and watch Phineas and Ferb instead of doing their homework. So help me, help me pin this app. Help. Ron, do you know uh, how to do this? I hope you do, because I'm I, right. I'm putting you on the spot here. Putting you on the spot. I've got to remember. So I know we go into settings as one always does, and we are going to choose. I want to say, see, here we go. I couldn't. I can't remember if it's so, privacy or if it's. So else. I've got an app like this Microsoft Map Math app we talked about last week, which inspired this whole project, by the way, because it's such a cool teaching app. So I'd like to say, okay, you know, I want to give this to the kid, but I don't want him to do anything else. It's also good for proctoring exams and things like that, right? You could say, uh, we're going to give you a test and you can't get out of the test. Is it under parental control? I'm sorry to spring this on you. I should have brought this up sooner. Is no, this is a good... Um, but I do feel uh, like it's the first thing you want to know is how to lock something down. You know, I bet you if I just search for PIN, not PIM, <laughs> PIN <laughs> app, uh, no, Pinterest, a lot of stuff on Pinterest. Um, nope, I guess that search is just not helping us. I want to think it's, it's been moved into screen time. How to set up parental controls on your iPhone. <laughs> wow. I love it. We can't do it. We uh, can't do it. It's not smart lock. It is under screen time. It's under okay, screen so, time. All right, let's go. Yeah, we're going to launch screen time. Okay, so let me go down here to screen time. It's right above general. Oh, it's, 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 it's of course, it's more important than general. It's, it's up there. And, and you can choose, see I'm 52% down from last week. So I'm Make being, sure that's... Good. Yeah, it looks like you have screen time turned on. That's good. And then tap content and privacy restrictions. Okay. And then you turn can those choose. Turn on. Yeah, okay. Yeah, turn those on. And then you can choose allowed apps. Okay. And just set it to. Just do it like that. Yeah, just say yeah. just that one app. I wonder if I can then. Now, Michael, uh, turn on screen time. I could turn on screen time for him. But, okay. Choose apps you want at all times. Allowed contacts. This really does have a lot of control. So yeah, I guess just it used saying to be a little bit. Uh, it, there was less control and more just er, you get this one app. But now it seems that it, it, there are a lot more settings that you can flip switches on and change. But yeah, there used to be an option to just sort of I just want this one app. Yeah, it, it, you know what I what I used to do when I would hand off my uh, iPad. How to lock apps on iPhone using guided access. So let's That's try it. that. It's guided access. Right, yeah, let's general. Try that. And then accessibility. It's an instead. accessibility thing. Oh, wait. Accessibility is its own screen now. That's right. Um, <laughs> so let's go down to accessibility and, and choose then guided, guided access. access. Okay. And that's off. Guided access keeps the iPad in a single app there we go. and allows you to control which features are available. So you can have a passcode, which is probably a good idea. Or even use oh Face ID, Ooh, then, then you, you can go. only unlock it, right? Clever, clever. You could have a time limit, which is kind of cool. Oh my God, you can set an alarm. <laughs> you could say, nope, you're done. Uh, you could have accessibility shortcuts that you may or may not want. And uh, you could also see how long it takes your iPad to automatically lock during a guided access. You could have auto lock turn off, which I would because you don't want to have to have them come running over and saying, Daddy, can you unlock your iPad for me? So just turn off auto lock, um, turn on guided launched. access. Yeah, and then and you the app that you want to use, and then you triple click that uh, top button. You, so you, so if I triple, so I go into my math app, and mm -hmm. then I just triple click, and I say, it says guided access. Oh, you can't see it. Let me move it down a little bit. It says guided access, and then start. And now I'll enter a passcode, one, two, three, four, five, six. Not a good passcode, one, two, three, four, five, six, but an easy one to remember. And now to exit it, you triple click. But see, this is great. Now the kids can only do their math problems. They can't swipe up to get out. They can't <laughs> swipe around. They can't get out. They're stuck doing their math problems. 11. 11. That's what I, that's exactly what I typed there. So, and then if you want, if it's, you know, parental time, you, you triple click this. Oh, try again with face ID. And that ended it. So I, uh, instead of using the pin, I used face ID, which was kind of cool. 
So now I can get out of it. Nice. So that's a good that's a good thing to know for uh, parents if you're going to hand off your iPad. You know, it's not that you know kids are trying to cheat, but it's just too easy for them to do something else or exit and actually more importantly, accidentally exit. Exactly. Keep them in there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very distra I mean, I can get distracted. I might want to set guided access for yeah, myself. I know. Just to keep I know. From uh, work, switch Leo, around a bunch. work, work, don't do anything else. Right. Oh, well, there's a notification. Let me hop over. No, no, no. You got to stay here. Yeah. So that's so good. I'm we have brought some there. apps to show you that you might want to lock in. Yeah, with your, lock it with in. your kitties. You know, can I just show this real quick? Because I just I think Microsoft deserves such credit for what they've done uh, with Minecraft. This is the education version. This is interesting. I'd never heard of this. Yeah. Now I can't. If I go back here, I can't uh, use the full game unless I have a my, my Microsoft education account. So check with your school and see if you can get one. And I, you know, I hope you have one because. They have physics, they have chemistry, there's all sorts of lessons. And because it's Minecraft, for a certain age, I'd say 7 to 13 or 14, this is going to be a lot more fun. So here's our problem. A village is threatened by fire, needs your help. This is a beginner one. One hour, it's the hour of code, AI for good. Program your coding assistant, the agent, to navigate the forest and collect data about the fires. Then... Write code to help wow. pre prevent the spread of fire, save the village, and bring life back to the forest. See, isn't that awesome? That's really cool. Now, for, for parents, you can go uh, to the uh, website and see the lesson plan, or this was actually intended for teachers originally. But a good idea as a, as a parent, if you're going to be doing this, to read through the prep and the notes, especially... If you don't know much about programming, you might you might learn something too. And I think for younger kids, this would be a great thing to do together. So let's cre create the world, and the import has started, and now we are generating a world. Computers have to be taught to learn, sort of like students. AI is used <laughs> to collect and analyze forest data, which is faster than counting trees by hand. Again, a seven-year-old, you might read that to them and work with them. And now we are in... Which is so great. So your fir first quest is to talk to the researcher. So let's just walk up here and talk to the researcher. Nice. I have to right click. Oh, I, oh, I can press a button. Welcome to the research center. Here you'll you're gonna now. Notice, by the way, I just want to mention this real quickly. This is also on a PC, so that's where the right click me comes from. But you'll see on oh, <laughs> whoa, you'll see on an iPad. You can also press a talk button, and that's good, so that you don't have gotcha. to use your mouse. Welcome to the research center. Here you'll use blah, 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 blah. press C to start coding. All right, or touch the agent icon. Press C to code, or touch the agent icon. There's the okay. helper bot. Is the agent the one on the top right, uh, to the left, to the right of the pause button? Is that an agent? This. In the middle of the screen at the top, there's a pause button. Oh, there's the agent. Then, oh, the agent? Oh, yeah. Starting tutorial. Very good. See, you'd make an excellent student. <laughs> okay. And you're going to see that this is a kind of programming that we've talked about before, this kind of modular style of programming where you drag pieces on. So this is on start. That says, I know it's a little small. It's hard to read. I'm going to drag. And you can click and show a hint. I'm going to drag open gate over and plug it in to that module and then nice. i'll press play and let's see the gate opened nice. i can go in so Made then we're going to walk in to the wall now can you use your if if you were connected are you able to use the keyboard yeah, the ipad yeah, yeah, keyboard yeah. nice yeah. that's cool yeah i'm not right now and typically you know it depends on the kid you don't have to have oh, a keyboard a to point. do this the kid might just be holding it uh, yeah. So it just depends on how you're going to do it and whether you have a keyboard. But it's not required for this because in every case, they give you a, a, a simple way to, if I tap the helper bot, I can talk to the helper bot. This is the agent. So I'm not going to go through this whole thing. But as you can see, this is going to be a coding lesson. But what's mm -hmm. great from the point of view of a kid is this is a world they know and love and they feel very comfortable in. And so... Uh, I think this is just a, a really nice thing Microsoft has done to make Minecraft one of the most popular. It is the most popular PC game of all time and very popular with kids. So if you have a kid, I would say sixth grade, middle school, 
maybe some early high school, uh, depending on how motivated they are. You know, I have a 12th grader or 11th grader, soon to be 12th grader, and he is so interested in Minecraft still, and he wants to learn coding. This is kind of a natural thing. Yeah. So this is available in the App Store. It's uh, the education edition of Minecraft. You can find it. Uh, it's what I, the one hour of code thing is a demo that you can use without having an account, but for the full uh, education, uh, Minecraft education, you'll need a Microsoft education account, a student or a teacher. What about you, Mr. S Mr. Micah? Well, something that I think about is uh, being back in school and having to purchase a graphing calculator and how pricey those TI-84, whatever number we're on now, uh, calculators could be. And sometimes, you know, the, the classes would have them, but um, maybe you're at home and so you can't get one from the class, um, but you you do have, you know, a, an iPhone or an iPad device uh, in the house. And I was pleasantly surprised to discover that there is a free, and when I say free, I mean completely free, not free with in-app purchases, but free uh, graphing calculator uh, available in the App Store. It's called Desmos Graphing Calculator, and it is a, you know, a full-on, um, well, let's go back, getting started is what I was looking for. Uh, it's a full-on graphing calculator that will actually use, you know, everything. You've got your your quadratic equations and and inequalities and integrals and all sorts of things uh, that will let you uh, graph your functions and regressions and charts and, and lines and things like that. Um, I have received this question more than many other, you know, folks asking, uh, what is an app that I can use for my algebra class or my, you know, beginning calc class? And it could be kind of hard to discover an app that didn't cost a billion dollars, but that provided uh, the graphing calculator functions that you need to be able to, you know, create graphs and things like that. And so you can see here uh, a simple line that you can adjust uh, and start to see how the equation is shaped by the changes in the uh, in the variables, as well as you know parabolas, um, including let's see where was the one that I was looking for, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, not polar. But oh yeah, here we go. Some transformations and things like that. This, this is very complicated stuff that I can remember. It was sort of. Um, a magical dance of buttons you had to press on a graphing calculator to try and figure out how to make this happen. And the teacher ended up becoming more of a tech support person in those times rather than teaching how to solve these math equations because of how involved it was. And so to be able to hop in and find uh, a specific category like transformations and translations and then be able to make adjustments to those to see how the graph is shaped by that is incredible. And honestly, I'm a little jealous that I didn't have it uh, back in high school when I was learning about these uh, different <laughs> different graphs and functions and things like that. Um, and again, I can't stress this enough. This is a free, uh, utterly free graphing calculator that I've downloaded and I haven't even created an account or anything like that. And I'm already in it using it completely. It's got loads of tutorials uh, where you can learn how to use it even more and uh, a user guide and, you know, it works with a keyboard and everything. So it is a very powerful tool that can help you. Um, oh, and I, I forgot to mention too, it's got lots of uh, localizations. So it's in many a language, not just English, but uh, several other languages as well. So if you're looking for a graphing calculator, um, whether you be, uh, again, a parent or a, a guardian trying to help a student with, with math or an actual student who needs a graphing calculator at home, this seems to be a fantastic option, Desmos graphing calculator. You know, there is a tool that's a little more uh, general that I recommend everybody have on their iPad or their iPhone. You can use it for free on your computer. Uh, and I think you're going to know this because you interviewed its creator, um, yes. Stephen Wolfram. I Wolf love Wolfram Alpha. Wolfram Alpha is an amazing website. But there is also a Wolfram Alpha 
uh, uh, app. And in some ways, I think it's probably uh, cool just to give it to the kid or show it to the kid. Again, I would say this is middle school and up. Uh, but, a, but a smart young kid might be able to use it as well. If you go, the app, I can't remember what the app is on the uh, store. I think it's maybe five. 2 dollars 2 dollars It's not very expensive. But if you um, just give it to the kid and let them play around with some of the simple problems. And you see there is algebra and it will even do graphing. Uh, and so this is a great way to experiment, to learn. And what's cool about it is, you know, these examples that I'm entering in are, are pre-programmed, but you can enter in your own as well. You can even enter in word problems because it understands text. So for instance, if I typed next solar eclipse, it would tell you it's going to be June 20th. It will show you the path of the solar eclipse. It'll give you all sorts of information. Kids also will have fun saying things like, um, Micah, let's see how common a name Micah is. Oh, it doesn't know how. So let's say, um, first name you got to type it right. Micah versus first name Leo. Let's see if I can understand my misspellings. I, I'm, I'm, I wish I had my keyboard, but I took it off so that we could uh, show this. Did I get that right? All right, let's see if it'll, if it'll understand that. So one of the things you can do is start typing in uh, names. Uh, assuming Micah female, use Micah male instead. I'm sorry, Micah. And, <laughs> That's okay. Uh, I didn't know that. There's Mika, I think is how you pronounce it if it's a, if it's a woman. And then assuming Leo male that you can, and then it compares the ranks. They're, you're, you're a much less common name, 1,507th. I am 50th. That means one in 16,000 people are named Micah. Wow. One in 268 people are named Leo. There are 112 new people per year with your name and you could see the pot. This is really awesome. The popularity of the name. Micah My name was... is the blue line. You can't see it's practically <laughs> zero, but you could see with more common names, how population popularity rises. It was a very popular name in 1903 and it's gone down ever since, but believe it or not, Leo Look has started to come back up uh, in the 2010s. Oddly enough, how many people are alive today? The age distribution Micah. Wait, hold on. What? Did, did it does 1285 people named Micah live today in, in the all, world? In all that's the world. Weird. But that's isn't weird. that So and by the way, kids love doing this. So you can say first name Mary versus first name Sally or whatever. And they love playing with that. This is such a fun tool. I would start by just There's going so much. It's infinite. Basically, yeah. it's a search engine for knowledge is, I think, the what Stephen wanted to make it because you can look up people. You know, we just saw the movie Harriet Tubman. This is kind of like Wikipedia in that sense. In fact, I think it pulls some information from Wikipedia, but you get pictures, you'll get a timeline. This is one of, amazing. I wish I'd had this when I was a kid. One of my favorite things, uh, a lot of times it can be kind of difficult to to picture numbers yes. in terms of, of, you know, uh, especially lengths or, 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 uh, height or things like that. And so typing in, you know, something that is, uh, nine yards and then it compares it. It's, it's like nine yards is equal to six zebras standing on, on end or six, you know, <laughs> I love that. that's up so and down. great. I love being able to see that. And then there's also one of the, <laughs> I think a, a challenge is think about like, third cousin twice removed. Yes. It will show you a chart of who that cousin is and what yes. that actually means. Um, and, you know, you could even type in your birth date and learn about what happened on that day uh, and what, the, you know, what the moon was on that day. What uh, there's just so, so, so much. It's by the way, it's giving me 11 divided by 29 divided by 1,956. But let's see if it figures out that I'm not doing a math problem. Yes, it's interpreting it as my birthday. Uh, it was the first day of Hanukkah in, uh, in 1956. Uh, the Sand Creek Massacre happened on that day. Wow. <laughs> the, the first Army-Navy football game. So this is, yeah, when was the sunrise? When was the sunset? I mean, this is just 
really in a cool waning stuff. crescent moon. Yeah. yeah, but go, but start with the examples. And and honestly, if you've got a kid that loves to learn, maybe just let them have it. Say, you know, can I use the iPad, Daddy? Sure, lock it in, and then just say, "Air," and they're gonna say, "Oh." What is this? And I'm hoping we'll start pushing some buttons. Here is information about a four by four by twelve piece of lumber. Piece of lumber. <laughs> and I recommend watching uh, that interview, the triangulation interview, because oh, I ended up yeah. getting Stephen Wolfram to work with Pokemon. And so we were pulling up random Pokemon and graphing them. He was able to, to make uh, an actual equation that would graph the Pokemon so that it was actually shaped like Pikachu in in the graph. It was amazing. I'm so jealous that you got to stalk, talk to him because he's legendary. And you got him to show you some neat features of Wolfram Alpha. That's so cool. It was really cool. Really, really yeah. cool. This is one of my favorite learning programs for kids and adults. It's just a great thing. Every iPad, every iPhone should have it. And by the way, Siri does often use Wolfram Alpha. If you ask yep. her uh, some certain kinds of questions, like math questions, she'll look it up on Wolfram Alpha. Yeah, and uh, Mr. Wolfram said that was a huge moment uh, for bet. them. I bet. Really? Yeah. And I, not only not only in terms of uh, the you know being plugged into that and then having uh, their service used, but also for the sake of of the search queries and things like that. So yeah. the data back was yeah. really helpful. Uh, very cool stuff. Um, next, I will talk about something that could be grading for <laughs> for um, adults, but I think the point of this is to kind of let a child. Uh, watch and learn, and then you kind of get to, you know, let them do their thing. And that is Marco Polo World School. Uh, which <laughs> this is, is for little kids, obviously, yeah? Yes, I think it's uh, ages four to seven, if I remember correctly. Um, so a, a sort of specific age range, but... Um, there are 500, more than 500 video lessons. There are 3,000, oh, it's ages three to seven, 3,000 plus learning activities. Um, plus it's received a bunch of different awards. So it was, for example, it was an, it has an Emmy nominee. Um, it's received uh, several awards from different teaching groups and things like that. Uh, it It's designed by PhDs with uh, early childhood education, you know, backgrounds. So it's a, it's a, it's a tool that, is based in science in terms of teaching kids um, how to uh, teaching kids different things. So let's see here. We'll go into this, and I believe I am playing. Oh, it's got a lot of fun sounds. It's like a busy box. Yes, exactly. and this is a perfect example of you're going to give this to a four year old. You're definitely going to want to lock it in so that they can't. Australia. They don't get frustrated falling out of it. You know they. Right. Exactly. bears. Polar bears. Hey, a koala. I'll add it to my bear journal. Yes. So it starts to teach you different things about, for example, in this case, it's koalas. Uh, but Okay, this is a little frustrating for me. Again, as I said, this is really meant to be a tappable screen for kids to just sort of exist in the space, like you said, and get to learn about different things. So there are all of these different uh, challenges up at the top that they can go through. And it's really about sort of giving kids autonomy um, and letting them sort of guide learn. their own learning. Yeah. You know, there's that's the Montessori principle, which is uh, that they let kids discover on their own. They give them uh, projects they can work on and let them learn on their own. And I think if it's done right, it's a very powerful tool for younger children. Now, this is a, uh, it comes with a 30 day trial. Um, and then at that point, if you choose to keep it, it becomes $9 and 99 cents a, a month. So about 10 bucks a month after that 30 days free. So I, guess, now, I presume that for that, you're getting new content all the time. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, they're this is well done. I have new... to say, and I, you could see how they would want to. It, it's, it's that sounds expensive. It is, but you could see if they're putting a lot of new content in all the time that it's worth it. Absolutely, and and like I like you know we kind of talked about it, you can clearly tell that it is designed for. Um, for those kids between the ages of, of four and seven to be yeah. able to, or three and seven, to be able to sort of take this on their own and really cool. uh, enjoy. So what I just quickly about the setup process, um, whenever I first created the, the, whenever I first installed the app, then I was able to create a parent account um, and then create a child 
uh, account underneath the parent. So of course I named that child Leo um, <laughs> for the sake of the show. And you can create little different Leo. <laughs> yeah, exactly, little Leo. Uh, and then there's the uh, parent section that lets you uh, see your child's. Uh, what am I trying to say? Your child's progress. Thank you through the app. Uh, so you can see the skills that they've learned, the progress that they have, uh, come across and then make adjustments to, you know, what are their favorite subjects and things like that. Uh, so yeah, it's a very, it's a very involved app, uh, very, you know, filled with different content. And like we talked about always updating with new stuff. I, you know, I, uh, I like it that you took the younger side. I seem to be taking the older kids. <laughs> uh, my next one is definitely for, uh, older kids, even kids my age. Uh, and I should say, this is just an example of a whole category of amazing tools for learning. This is a edx.com and it was started by MIT and Harvard so that they could put their cat, their courses online. But now there are many, many universities that use edx. These are free courses. This, you don't pay for these courses. It's edx. Uh, and they are some of the best universities in the world and some of the best courses in the world. You see, I have a couple that I've been taking here, which are geeky things, how to write computer code. Uh, there is the world-famous Harvard Introduction to Computer Science, CS50. Mm -hmm. And I would say uh, a high school, smart high school kid, this would be a re – it moves fast, but it has it, – what is nice about all of this, in fact, let me go back to the, one of the courses I'm taking because I can show you um, having taken it. And I, by the way, I got a certificate and you can pay to get a certificate. Um, I don't know how <laughs> valuable that would be, but it, it shows your grade. It says you, you, well, it doesn't show your grade. It says you got a passing grade. I actually got 98. I wish nice. it showed my A+. plus. However, <laughs> <laughs> it does... This certificate could be of value. It depends on the course you take. In fact, they even have what they call master's tracks, where this is the first in a series of five or six classes. If you complete all six, you can get a, a, even a higher level degree. But let me just show you a little bit of the features of this. And this is true for the courses, although they vary because they come from different schools. This comes from the University of uh, British Columbia. And this is the professor, Gregor Gonzalez. He teaches you, uh, and he'll be your teacher in the course. He'll he'll uh, walk you through things. And so this is the syllabus. They're, they do show you a uh, syllabus of everything that you're going to be doing, uh, how many hours it will take to complete it. There are practice problems. There are quizzes. There are some self-assessed quizzes, but at the end, you also get assessed by a, uh, an actual um, TA from the university. Wow. So you, you really aren't, you know, you're not just kind of sleepwalking your way through this if you want to now again you don't have to pay for it if you don't want a certificate you can if you want to you can download the videos to your device which is great um, you also get lecture questions uh, so we're going to watch the video this this is for booleans and if expressions this is a very early on he'll show you as we go through it He'll show you, let me see, he'll show you the screen so you can watch his screen. Very legible, very nicely done. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, you can both do this on a computer or I think it works really well on the iPad. And let me just show you uh, a quiz here so you can, um, let's see if I can find a good quiz. Lecture questions. So, oh, not available on mobile, so you have to do this in Safari. But that's okay. You still can do it on your iPad. It just launches the course, and I now I have to log in. So let me just do that real quickly. I have to put my face in front of it. Okay. And sign in real quickly. All right. And now let's uh, take a look at the questions. Um, hello. Why am I not seeing those? Well, maybe it doesn't. Uh... Ah, there we go. So then these are questions, and you actually do get to submit your answer. You can see the answer after you submit it. You get to evaluate in some of the self-evaluated ones. You get to evaluate your answer. 
I already answered all of these, so it's really not a good example of uh, how to do it. But I really think they've done a great job. This is edx.org. But the point I'm saying is this is just one of many, many places you can go uh, to get incredible college-level classes. And I think for a smart high schooler, these would be just fine. By the way, this is the one I would start with and everybody should take first, which is how to learn online. And again, this is free. It is a very useful course uh, because you're going to learn how to learn. And I think uh, this is actually hugely valuable uh, for everybody. $50 if you want the, certif the certification. I don't For this one, I don't know if a cert would really be worth anything. But free if you just want to do it uh, yourself. And there's programming. There's all sorts of stuff. There, it, uh, it languages, business and management. Um, it is in a variety of languages. I think they've really done a wonderful job. And by the way, it's no longer just Harvard and MIT. It is schools all over the world. And so if you're looking for, you know, science programs or math or languages, there's all sorts of stuff. This is EDX. But I want to point out there's iTunes U, which is a great place to go uh, to get other college-level courses. In fact, one of the best courses on iTunes U is Stanford's course, which they give every year uh, on, on writing um, iOS apps. And actually, this is the old one from fall 2011, but they have a new one every year. So uh, you should always use the newest one, obviously, because things change. Here's Core Concepts in Chemistry from Duke University. This, these are also free, and this is in iTunes U. The thing that blows me away is a smart kid these days could absolutely um, get the equivalent of a, of a college education from the best universities in the world for absolutely nothing. Just having an iPad or almost nothing. You'd have to have the iPad and Internet access, but that's all you'd need. And to me, this is the real revolution of all of this. You know, you can, you, you can start a kid uh, early on with, with the app you showed, Micah, and move them all the way through. I mean, look at all of the courses. These are available uh, going even, by the way, to preschool and kindergarten. So iTunes U is an absolute must for anybody who, uh, who has an app, uh, iPad or I guess you could do it on an iPhone. It would be better on an iPad. You could see it, it uses the screen better. History. Fabulous courses. I try to take a course when we travel. I've, I've enjoyed taking courses um, in the country, about the country we're going to see, ancient Greece, myth, art, war. There's courses from Yale on here, the early Middle Ages. You know what? That's a good one. I'm going to take that one because I love the early Middle Ages. Uh, this is about getting out of the Roman era and into the Middle Ages. And as you can see, this is the actual college course. This is the professor in a classroom at Yale University. There is a variation in the quality of the recording and so forth, but you're getting an amazing experience. This is as if you're in the classroom. And in many cases, even with iTunes U, you have interactive resources. You could even sometimes get help from uh, live TAs and things like that. International system in the 20th century. There's no reason to be uh, ignorant anymore. Everything <laughs> is here, right? There's right. no reason in the world not to... So, so uh, this iTunes, uh, EDX is, is an example. iTunes U is an example. Many other open courseware from MIT. Yale has its own uh, system. And, and as I said, almost all universities are also on iTunes U. So my point is not any one program, although I really like edx.org and iTunes U. There's a variety of these. By the way, iTunes U also has... The, teach, the teaching at Apple that they used to do today, Apple that they used to do at the Apple stores, they do that at home now. And you can, this is actually a great course for teachers uh, on, on uh, using these resources. So uh, as a parent, I mean, I'm looking for ways that you could just sit a kid down and say, and then leave. <laughs> <laughs> and a, well, a motivated kid. Now, sometimes kids aren't that motivated. You might want to sit down with them, spend some time, but you'll learn too. And these are so well done. I, if a kid is interested in computer science, CS50 uh, at EDX is incredible. The Harvard introduction to uh, computer science. It moves very quickly. It will be very helpful if you know a lot of this course material and you can be the TA that works along with your kid. Um, 
I, I think it's just fantastic that this stuff is available. I'm just, I'm blown away. Um, I just, I just, we live in amazing times. We really do. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, it's awesome. The, yeah. the content that's available to us for free. Yeah. Um, speaking of, of being able to sit the kid down and kind of, uh, let them go. Um, I, th I can't in good conscience recommend this next app in terms of a long-term choice. Um, unless you really, really, what, what I mean to say is $20 a month is expensive. And so, unless you find that this app is something that you are going to really be keeping around and really wanting to use, um, I can't recommend it in terms of the, the long term. And I, I, you know, I'm not, um, so unaware as to think that $20 a month is, is reasonable, uh, in most cases, but with two weeks free, there are some really fun and really exciting and engaging courses, uh, from DIY.org. Um, so, this this app ha is great for for two reasons. One, because it has some excellent and engaging courses. But two, because as you can see, uh, there's a little area underneath uh, Strange Science that says "Challenges Done," and it actually, as you complete courses, you gain points as you're going through. So it sort of gamifies the learning process, but it makes it a lot of fun. So. I don't know about you, but if there's one thing that I've seen a lot of on Instagram videos, it's slime this and slime that. Uh, I know that uh, the Howl children have made slime uh, multiple times, and this app uh, has a whole bunch of different tutorials for creating your own slime. And you can see these great videos that show you uh, exactly how to uh, go through the process. Yeah! <laughs> yeah this is for the youtube generation isn't it and i have mm -hmm. to say a lot of this is on youtube or stuff similar is on youtube for free but the, what they're giving you here is a little more curation a little more uh, quality and i mean you're paying for the curation as much as anything else right i mean i bet you if you search for slime you could find a pretty good slime video on youtube or two exactly right exactly yeah. and and you, yeah you're paying for the curation you're paying for um the the in-depth sort of op options here. So it's not just that, you know, it, you're, you're right. You can find recipes and things like that, but this really is uh, designed from the ground up to sort of walk you through the processes. And uh, it's not, again, again uh, strange science is just one. So you can learn about uh, how to make fake poo, but in the process of learning how to make fake poo, you learn about the digestive system. Um, you can learn about mold and create your own mold in a mold terrarium, uh, hot and cold stuff. So how a thermos works, how a cooler works, uh, as well as making your own light switcher. Uh, so that I, I can remember doing that as a kid, uh, making a light switcher in my room where I, <laughs> I just had a bunch of yarn and I had rigged up a pulley system from, well, we had just learned about simple machines in, in school and I'd rigged up a pulley system, uh, so that I could, from my bed, I was making the smart home before the smartphone home was around. So I could pull on the, th the one string to turn off the light and pull on the other string to turn on the light. And there were just pieces of yarn going across my entire space. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in here for curious kids, you know, strange science is just one, but there are also courses for, uh, drawing and, uh, you know, doing camp at home. Um, it is a really involved process or really involved app that has so many different types of projects that you can take on, uh, learning how to draw, learning how to animate, learning how to invent your own machines, become a music star. I mean, it's pretty cool. The different stuff that they have available, uh, in this app. And like I said, the way that they gamify it by having you, you know, gain points as you go through and complete these different challenges, uh, including the feature challenges like dressing as a witch or wizard, <laughs> which of course you can see is a very easy challenge. <laughs> That's cute. 
and then some that are 15 minutes or less and things like that. So, so this, this is, must be done by educators for this price. You've got to have, this is basically courseware. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, so again, that's DIY.org with a two week trial. Um, you know, give it a go at least yeah. give it a, give it a chance to see the different stuff that's available. And you might find that you've got a kid that really digs into it and, and starts completing all these challenges. And then you can make the choice after that, if the 20 bucks a month is something that you want to keep around. Well, I think we should take a break. This is, I, I mean, we so. have a lot more, but uh, I don't think we're... I think that we, covers it in terms of... gives you yeah, enough apps. to chew on to get started. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to go to your news, your questions, and our app caps in just a little bit. But first, a word from our sponsor. We're sitting here in the beautiful Last Pass Studios in beautiful, the beautiful east side of Petaluma. We love Last Pass. Last Pass, our sponsor, is uh, the ultimate password vault but it's really so much more these mm -hmm. days and i think it's important to kind of take a look at it. i hope you're using LastPass at home they have three versions there's LastPass premium for the individual LastPass family that's what we use at our our house uh which has some nice features i could share with uh, lisa passwords and so forth uh, we can have a folder where all the family passwords are so she has access to the passwords she needs for things like the utility bills and so forth and and uh, there's even an emergency access feature that lets you designate a family member or not. I could make it Micah, but I'm not gonna. So should, <laughs> if anything should happen to me, th that person would have access to my passwords so that they could settle my affairs, things like that. That's the family uh, version of LastPass. There's also LastPass Enterprise. And if you're a business and you're not using LastPass, I really want to talk to you because LastPass is so important. We started using LastPass Enterprise a few years ago when one of our employees put all of his passwords, including passwords to our web servers and our databases on a public web page because he could never remember them. Employees no. do silly things with passwords. They really do. They, <laughs> I know, I know. That was my reaction. No! <laughs> Employees will put them on post-it notes on the screen. You remember, uh, what was it, uh, War Games, where they, they had the password under the blotter at the school so he could change his grades. Uh, there's a lot of dumb things people do with passwords. LastPass helps them do the right thing. And with all your employees going home and working from home in many cases, it becomes even more important. The beauty of LastPass, it can be deployed quickly in the midst of any event to make sure your business keeps running smoothly and every login is secure no matter where it comes from. They have more than passwords, though. Single sign-on is such a great thing. Our employees love it. Over 1,200 apps. Instead of having to know a password, you just approve the login. You get a message on your phone, press a button, and you're in. And that is, believe it or not, both more secure and more convenient. Usually that, that, that doesn't compute. It's one or the other. It's <laughs> more secure, more convenient. And using SSO means IT always has insight into who has access to what and where they're accessing it from. That's great. Of course, they've got the best password management, enterprise-level password management. And from my point of view... When enterprise in this context means that you've got oversight of shadow IT, you've got enforceable policies across all password-protected accounts. We, for instance, require two-factor. We have minimum requirements for the master password, things like that. They've also added multi-factor authentication, more than just biometrics like Touch ID or Face ID. Uh, they have things like contextual things like geolocation, IP address, and more. That makes it easier, again, easier for employees but safer for you. You know that the person who's supposed to be accessing that and no one else is accessing that account. Businesses have to think about additional layers of defense beyond the password. And that's why LastPass does so many things right. For instance, and we, by the way, we went through this with Steve Gibson. He looked at all the code with Joe Segrist. And Steve uses it now, which gives you some idea, our security guy. LastPass never sends or stores the master password. And the reason for that, if LastPass can't access your data, hackers can't access your data. The encryption is always at device level and only at device level. It's encrypted before sent to LastPass, only decrypted on the device, and every device, by the way, Android, iOS, Windows, Mac, Linux, there's browser plugins for all the browsers. And it's all encrypted with military-grade 256-bit AES, the best you can get. LastPass protects while providing a seamless workflow for your employees. It's both secure and convenient. And... With employees distributed now, they're all at home or in different places. It's nice that they can share 
passwords securely with other employees, or you can. In fact, we have folders for all the different departments, and when we onboard a new employee, we just give them access to that folder. It makes it really, really easy and still secure. MFA, SSO, the best password management in the world. It's LastPass. LastPass can help make remote work simple and secure. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help your business stay productive and secure no matter what happens. Lastpass.com slash twit. We thank them so much for their support of iOS Today. On we go with the show, with the news, and here he is, the newsman of the hour, Mikey Sargent. Bra -ba 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 -bra Folks, iOS 13.5. It came uh, Wednesday. It came Wednesday. It didn't, it didn't do it. We thought it would do it last week, but the day after. The day it after. was the day after. Uh, iOS 13.5 introduces a couple of new things. Uh, people are calling it the COVID-19 update because it includes uh, the API for contact tracing and also a new feature that makes it easy. Uh, I don't know about you, but I have kind of been missing Touch ID a little bit lately um, because I've been... Yeah, I don't know, have to. I have an iPhone SE. I'm golden. Oh, nice. <laughs> Nice. See, I've been out and about on occasion, very rare occasions yeah, to go to the wearing store. Yeah, when you mask, it can't recognize you. can't I, see your face. I got a fingerprint reader. You I got a touch that. ID, yeah. you, you turkey. Uh, but I do not have touch ID, nor am I a turkey. And so I uh, am happy that now the face ID technology can see or it can predict uh, or it can tell if you have a mask on in most cases. And if it does, then it automatically presents you with the option to type in your code. So instead of it going, nope, not you, nope, not you, nope, not you, and then finally presenting the option to type in your code, it will just do it automatically. Um, unfortunately, and fortunately, I don't know, uh, I use a very long code uh, because of Face ID being the way that I normally log in. So it still takes me a while to get in. But, um, you know, Security, folks, security. The other thing uh, they added is this new COVID-19 API for contact tracing. And I, I want to show you where this is. I was really hoping I could show you uh, last week, but it came on Wednesday. But you have it if you've updated a 13.5. Go into your settings, and you're going to go to your privacy settings. Mm -hmm. And in there, there's health. And this is where the COVID-19 exposure logging, if you have the new 13.5, you'll have this new entry. <clears throat> Read it because it's important. When enabled, iPhone can exchange random IDs with other devices using Bluetooth. This allows an app to notify you if you may have been exposed to COVID-19. Now, the point is an app has to be written. In fact, if I try to turn this on, I can't. It says you can't turn it on without an authorized app installed that can send exposure notifications. So you may check with your state or your locality to see if they have an app, with your country to see if they have an app. And once they do, you'll see it here, installed app. You can see all the requests to check your exposure log. You can delete your exposure log. You have a lot of control over it. So that's all in this area in health and privacy, uh, the COVID-19 exposure logging. Now, I don't, I, I, I think... There are some states using the Apple Google. This is the Apple Google API. I'm not sure. So is it North I have a, Dakota's using it? I can't remember. I've got I a know. great article um, okay. that everybody needs to check out. Uh, and it's from Zach Hall at 9to5Mac. Zach has been yep. yeah, uh, a guest on Tech News Weekly a couple of times. And he has decided, thank goodness, to put together an article that he's keeping updated that shows the responses from different states, uh, including those who say they will be participating, uh, those who have yet to respond, and those who say that they are not participating, of which California currently says, um, we don't have any updates on apps at this time, but if that changes, we will let you know. Uh, so that is, he's regularly reaching out to uh, folks in these different states and seeing, what, I can't remember who he's talking to exactly oh, alabama uh, north dakota south carolina and virginia have all indicated that they will participate that's only four states four states and uh it looks like south dakota has their own app north dakota says they will be using it so this is really a good thing to read is each state 
and their plans. Part of the problem, I think the states are concerned about privacy. Sometimes they want more ability than the Apple Google uh, API will allow them. Uh, for instance, they, the Apple Google API will not let any uh, state or government exfiltrate the information, download the information about who you've run into that might have COVID-19. They would like to do in-person contact tracing. It doesn't give them that information, so they cannot. And uh, many countries have complained about that. France has. Uh, and so, and many states seem to be not too happy about that. So I wonder if states might in do their own apps so that they can get that information. Because it turns out, and I think we all agree that Steve Gibson did a great piece on this a couple of weeks ago, that human, and Bruce Schneier has written about it as well, human contact tracing is, is really the only thing that ultimately is going to work. And right. so an app can help, but the Apple app cannot, in fact, help because only the app can do the contact tracing. And Schneier's point is no app is going to do a very good job of this. You really need those human tracers. That's what the countries that have done this successfully, like China, Taiwan, South Korea, uh, they've all done this successfully and, in effect, reduced the number of infections to zero or just a little bit more by doing this kind of, you know, in-person testing and tracing. Very important to do both. And uh, so I think that there's a sense that maybe the Apple app is a good idea, that what Apple and Google did made sense, but it just doesn't go far enough and it won't be effective enough to do what everybody wants to do, which is go back to normal. To do that, right. you need extensive testing and contact tracing. It's just the only way uh, until we get a vaccine. So, um, I, yeah, I think that's probably part of the problem. Anyway, you have it. <laughs> Doesn't look like that's any it. app's going to use it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a frustrating thing. Yeah. I also say I'm a, I'm a little frustrated. I um, a family member. Um, <laughs> perusing the internet, uh, came across a video, um, that was published shortly after contact tracing was added to iOS and, and Android devices in, in recent updates, uh, with utter lies and falsehoods. So this yeah. video was full yeah. of, of utter lies and falsehoods. And it's, it's really frustrating. Um, when you, when you know, how the technology works and when someone just completely says something that's utterly it, and completely false. It doesn't share your address book. It doesn't share information. It doesn't have GPS. It, it doesn't, doesn't share location. And in fact, all of those protections, which people like for privacy, are the reason that many states and many governments don't want to don't use want it. it. <laughs> yeah. It's not that they want to spy on you. It's just that in-person contact tracing really is required. It's the only thing that works. And uh, and it's been shown again and again in a great many countries to work. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever get it here, but, uh, you know, and that's part of, the, part of the problem is people are very privacy uh, focused. And I understand that. Uh, and it does seem invasive if, you know, you go to a clinic, you get tested positive, the clinic sits you down and says, all right, you need to tell us everywhere you've been in the last 14 days. Mm -hmm. And you need to tell us everybody you've talked to and then goes out and starts calling those people uh, and and say, uh, Leo tested positive. You've been exposed to him. You have to go into quarantine for 14 days. That's a tough thing to do in the United States. They, the countries that do that, it's worked. It's succeeded. Uh, it's very effective. But it's a tough thing to do in the U.S. Uh, and maybe, maybe in other countries as well. So. Based on some of the reactions I've seen, yeah, people too. don't like that. Idea. Just wearing face masks, yeah. even yeah. is yeah. Well, um, speaking of of privacy and uh, desire for for more of it, uh, Ars Technica just published an article on the twenty first, uh, talking about a court decision um, that sort of could set precedent that suggests that just turning on your phone qualifies as searching it. So it used to be that location data and uh, sort of deeper access to a phone's data and and uh, activity required a search warrant. And this court has ruled that even unlocking the device, you know, powering up the, the lock screen uh, requires uh, a search warrant now. And of course, you know, as as it always goes, uh, one simple decision is not 
the be all end all. Um, but it does start to set precedent and it does start to, I think, sort of reopen the the conversation, if not just add to the conversation surrounding how much uh, protection we should have when it comes to our devices, which in many cases store more personal information than even our own brains do, which is one thing that, of course, we are protected from uh, self-incrimination. So I, I, I find this to be to continually be an interesting conversation, um, especially when we look at how companies uh, implement certain safeguards, like me squeezing the two volume buttons and the uh, side button at the same time to turn off Face ID uh, so that if I was in a situation where I did not want, you know, a, a law officer to get access to my phone by saying, look at your phone, you have to look at your phone to unlock it, then I can squeeze those buttons to sort of deactivate Face ID and make it so that um, unlocking the device requires typing in my passcode, which you may or may not have more of a chance of, you know, saying I'm not going to do that. I find this fascinating. I don't know about you, Leo. Yeah. Well... <laughs> what a world. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, there, there's not a whole lot to add uh, to the conversation. I just, this is this is just one, one more step sort of on that side of things where, uh, you know, is it or is it not the same thing? And is it protected by the Fourth Amendment? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I think this law stuff is fascinating. And I guess we'll, we'll see how this plays out the as... This court and no no one court except for the U.S. Supreme Court has jurisdiction everywhere. So, right. uh, you know, uh, well, I guess that's not true. I mean, if there are federal courts that have jurisdiction everywhere, but it, but the, the, there are conflicting opinions. That's the real problem. Yes, C courts don't always agree, and um, you know this this I don't you know this particular decision uh, applies I guess to to uh, Washington State, but. Um, I, I don't know if it applies to the rest of us, so <laughs> it's just unclear. Yeah, just unclear, uh, you know. I think it's because it had to do with the FBI, um, and and so that's where it kind of can gain more uh, national attention. And yeah. up to this point, you know, there's been the rule that I don't have to hand over my pin, but the FBI just used what was on the lock screen for evidence. Right. And so that is kind of a, oh, wait, should we be protecting the lock screen as well? Do we have that right under the Fourth Amendment? Yeah. I just think it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, one last bit of news, a super quick one. I know um, you weren't a huge fan of Mythic Quest. I also wasn't a huge fan of Mythic Quest. One of the uh, Apple TV Plus shows. Yes. Yeah. However... I watched the Mythic Quest quarantine episode, and I thought it was kind of a, a they had a, fun. a quarantine episode. They did, yes. So oh. the the whole the whole thing of the show is that it is a, a a game studio that produces this MMORPG, massively multiplayer online role playing game, and you have different people. You've got the creative, you've got the boss, who's sort of not the boss, um, and the head head developer and all these different people. And, and so it sh sort of shows all of these. It's a comedy. And um, they are showing how they are developing the game while working from home because of the quarantine. Uh, one of the characters, the main characters, she is Australian yeah. and she's the lead developer. And, um, you know, you'd think the whole thing is just going to be a funny thing, but it also shows her struggles of being so far away from home while this is going on and sort of being alone and how she was using work to distract herself from that sadness and, and, um, the, the struggle of not being able to be with the people that, you know, she, she cares about. And so it had some very real moments and it had some very clever moments, including some Rube Goldberg machining, uh, that took place. And so it ended up being really cool, but, um, it raised $600,000 oh, for wow. charity, uh, which is r really great. Um, and then also the team, the way that they filmed this was that everybody used iPhones uh, to film. So there were 40 iPhones, uh, 20 sets of earbuds, and they had, I think it was, um, I think it was about a week, if I remember correctly, uh, that, or no, three, sorry, three weeks. And they had shot, edited it and were ready to air it uh, to make it happen. And so I, it's really well done. I will um, watch it. I will watch I, it. Okay. You should. I think yeah. you should. Yeah, that was really good. Uh, 
but I love the idea that they shot this on iPhone and I love <laughs> the uh, way that the the old older man character um, he's trying to figure out how to use <laughs> the you know s- uh, Skype or, or Slack or whatever it happens to be and he ends up FaceTiming the woman and then suddenly oh, he's dear. The, uh, the video gets shut off and he's calling her and he, he even <laughs> at one point has an animoji character. It's really funny. So anyway, F, uh, F. Murray Abraham plays that part. Thank he's you. So good. Yeah, he is really good. Yeah. Uh, the Hollywood Reporter has the whole rundown on everything, and it's a it's a sort of question interview. Um, so you get to see the uh, all of the people talking about how this went from concept to reality. So I think it's a really fascinating read and kind of, I don't know, anytime I read those kinds of things, it makes me feel creative and makes me want to create. Uh, So it was a really energizing uh, article that when paired with the, you know, watching the episode, sort of those two went went together quite well. And I don't know, just it it brought my spirits up uh, all together. And so I really, I liked it a lot. Uh, you know what else we like a lot? Take a break because we're going to talk about my beautiful iPhone SE that I got from my beautiful sponsor, Mint Mobile. I love <laughs> Mint Mobile. Thank you, Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile uh, is, you know, the most amazing wireless company um, because they don't charge as much as the other guys do because they don't have the expensive retail stores. They do it all online. With Mint Mobile, I'm paying 25 bucks a month. You can pay even less, just 15 bucks a month with their three-month introductory plan. And you're getting the same quality service you get from the big boys. You're just paying a lot less. Unlimited nationwide talk and text. Crazy fast 4G LTE. You can bring your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan. Keep the same number. Port it right over. All your contacts. You can switch now to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless for 15 bucks a month. And don't worry, if you're not 100% satisfied, seven-day money-back guarantee. So it's really worth trying Mint Mobile. They had a great deal on the iPhone. Now, the $15 a month deal for three months, I highly recommend. But I, I did it, and I said, wow, this is so good. I am going to go and get uh, a year... And I decided I wanted 12 gigabytes of data a month. 12. 12. Uh, and un- unlimited nationwide talk and text. I thought, well, how much is that going to cost me? It costs me less than a third when I'm pairing the other guys. $300 for a year, that's $25 a month. I, that's why I gladly bought the year. What a great deal. $25 a month. Unlimited nationwide text, talk, and 12 gigabytes of data, which, by the way, I've never gone through. Not once. So it's nice to have. And I got this great iPhone SE. I told you I really like the fingerprint reader. The size is great. This does everything. It's just as fast. I really like this iPhone SE. This is the new iPhone SE. And I got a great deal from Mint Mobile. So check it out. Mintmobile.com slash iOS. Get your new wireless plan for just $15 a month with their three-month introductory plan. They'll ship you the SIM, the entire plan, to your door for free, contactless. You can put it in your existing phone Oh, they also sell phones like the iPhone SE at a really good price. Mintmobile.com slash iOS. Mintmobile.com slash iOS. Check it out for yourself, for family, for friends. Uh, you know, we, my father-in-law, it's just a great kids. It's just a great choice. And I think, honestly, the iPhone SE is a great a great companion to Mint Mobile. I'm really happy with it. Mintmobile.com slash iOS. <sighs> All right, let's get some uh, questions from our fine audience members here. All righty. Our first question comes from Adam from Iowa. Love the show. I've realized that I need to up my security on my internet accounts. And based on information about the YubiKey that Leo has shared in the past, I decided to go that route. Okay. I've noticed that some of my accounts don't offer the ability to use a security key. No. Instead, they... they they offer the use of an app to generate codes. Do you have any suggestions or advice on which app you prefer for this? So I'll tell you, let me tell you what I use, and then Micah, you can tell uh, them what you use. Yeah, YubiKey has an app, but actually, I really like Authy, A U T H Y. This comes from a company called Twilio, and uh, it's iOS, it's uh, Android, it even has a desktop app. And it's one of those desktop authenticators, gives you a uh, 
six-digit code every 30 seconds. And you can see I have a lot of accounts in here. In my opinion, a YubiKey or a physical hardware token is only slightly more secure uh, than an authenticator app. The reasoning is that it, in both cases, it's the second factor is something you have, either a physical key that you have on your keychain, in your pocket, in your desk drawer, or a phone uh, and the app running on your phone. If you've got good security on your phone, and you do if you're using uh, iOS, that app is, you know, just as secure probably as a YubiKey. Uh, it's it's generating a six-digit code which you have to type in. The YubiKey, you plug in uh, to a port on the phone. So that's another drawback, by the way, with a YubiKey. It's not going to work on every kind of hardware. I got a special YubiKey 5CI that has both a lightning port on one side and a Type-C connector on the other side. So it pretty much works with everything, including the iPhone uh, and the iPad. But it's expensive, if you lose it, you're going to have a problem. So you have to get at least two of them, put one of them in a safe place. I think an authenticator app for most people may be tiny, tiny bit less secure because you could lose your phone. Maybe somebody could get into it. I, I think it's just as secure, and it's free. So Authy is my favorite, and I'll tell you why. Actually, this is no longer the case for Google Authenticator, but for a long time with Google Authenticator, you didn't have an account. So if you got a new phone, if you had to wipe your phone and you got a new phone, you'd have to set up your two-factor all over again, which usually means going to each account, turning it off, getting a new two-factor QR code, putting it in the new app. Google just recently updated Authenticator so that you can save your codes, uh, which means that you can then install a new phone with Authenticator and restore. That's what Authy has done for years. It's one of the reasons I like Authy is you set it up once, it synchronizes to an account on Twilio. It's encrypted. You use a long encryption code to, you know, decrypt it. Um, I think it's fairly safe. That maybe makes it a little bit less safe because there is another place those codes exist outside of your phone. So, you know, that reduces the security a little bit. I trust Twilio. I trust Google. So uh, Microsoft Authenticator does the same thing. That's another great tool that will do it. The worst case scenario, and unfortunately there are still places that do this, chiefly banks, the worst case scenario is that second factor is a text message to your phone. As we've talked about many times before, text messages are not secure. So there's a real disadvantage. At least whenever you can use an authenticator app, if you want to use a physical dongle like a YubiKey, and there are many other companies that make these, but YubiKey is the best known, um, that may be slightly more secure. But then there is a much higher cost. These are expensive, and you need at least two of them, um, which means you know it's even a higher cost and a little more complicated to set up. I like the feeling of having a, a physical hardware key. The other thing to keep in mind is if you're using a physical key or an authenticator app, it's a good idea to turn off all other forms of two-factor. Because if, and in this is the case in many situations, there's a backup with the second factor where uh, the bad guy could send a text message to your phone, those are easily hijacked, then that's the, that's the weakest link in the chain you don't have the full security of an authenticator app or a YubiKey. So I do recommend using it. I think an authenticator app is fine. I use Authy. What do you use, Micah? Um, I started to use Authy per your recommendation after, uh, for a long time, I just used the password manager to do it. But you recommended separating those two yeah, and doing that as a yeah. separate one. So yeah, I started using Authy at, at that point. Uh, Google, thank goodness, has added that synchronization feature. We have there's a guy in the Twit community who said, "I feel so bad." He's I lost I lost access to my Twitter account because I turned on two factor and then my phone died and I didn't have my authentication oh, no. tokens. And so the other thing to keep in mind is you should always print a paper backup whenever you do two factor. They usually will say, "Okay, now here's some recovery codes that you can use just in case something goes wrong." Uh, print those. Put them in a safe place uh, because you don't want to be caught in that situation where you didn't have the uh, backup codes, you lost the authenticator, and now all of a sudden you can't get into your account. That wouldn't be good. We have a video question. Should I play it? Please do. Oh, how exciting. I want more of these. He does a little magic trick in this, too, <laughs> I might add. So you want to watch carefully. Here we are at the Johns Hopkins University Library. Hi, Leo, Micah. I've been doing a lot of exercise since the stay-at-home order was issued. 
I want to measure how many total miles I've done since March. How could I export my Apple Watch data in a readable format, something I could calculate in a Google spreadsheet on iOS? Thanks. Appreciate the show. I think there's a fountain in that library. <laughs> yeah. I, I was I hope that's what that is. A fountain. Yeah. So I love it because it becomes apparent pretty soon that it's a green screen. Because well, actually it's apparent right at the beginning because you see the library and then he just boop pops in and then at the end he moves over and pops out. So that's quite cute. I don't know the answer to this. I hope you do. Can yes. you so can you export your data? Yes. So there is an app um, that works very well. Uh, let's see. So there's the Quantified Self Project. And the Quantified Self Project is this online system for basically creating your quantified self. And it is paired with, you can pair it with the uh, Quantified Self app. And that lets you make um, there it is. The It's called QS Access, uh, which I will include a link in the show notes to QS Access. Uh, it's a free app. And what it lets you do is export your content in a machine-readable and human-readable format. Um, I guess I removed it from my phone here, so I can't uh, show it as easy. Uh, let me see where I have that because I want to show you how simple it is uh, to export data from it. But it essentially lets you – I don't know why I removed it. Um, but you go through and you select the measurements that you want to add to your uh, to the information. You can export it into a numbers document, an Excel document, basically anything that's a comma-separated value uh, reader. So you can see all of that information, plug it into Google Sheets however you want, and uh, graph that data. And the quantified self uh, service is what makes that possible. So let me send you that link, Leo. Um, so that if you want to pull it up, you can, uh, but it is a very helpful app here and put it in there as well. Uh, again, free to download. It doesn't have very good ratings and I'm not sure why, uh, but you, because you used it and it worked. Yeah, I've, exactly. I've used it and it works. In fact, I have a folder on my Mac uh, that's backed up to you know cloud storage where I just have my quantified self, uh, exported information. So it's all stored there and I can easily uh, see the information that's, you know, that's available to me uh, that I have slowly. And can you export. export it out as a comment separated value CSV file? Yeah. yeah. So that means you can import it into anything. Excel numbers uh, R, they say R, which is the statistical uh, programming language. So if you're really into the quantified self, that's, that's great. You can get all that health information. Out. I wonder if Apple has is they must have an API to do that. I don't know. How. Yeah, so there you can export directly from Apple Health, um, and it creates a zip file that has ah, okay. um, it has an XML format in it. But the problem so this is parses that. Yeah, the problem is that it exports it as a um, – uh, it's called a CDA, which is a health document that a lot of people don't have I apps see. or services that can read CDA I files. See. And so, yeah, it's a little bit different. It doesn't work the exact same way as just a simple CSV. So, yes, essentially QS reads that data and exports it as a CSV instead. So I've got um, steps in here. I've got distance in here. And this goes back as far as I – have been using the device. Uh, that's too big a file, so I can't see it. Let me see if I can read the steps one because I want to check the the starting date. And it goes all the way back to the beginning of ever since I started tracking, you know, since uh, HealthKit has been available basically on my device. So uh, 24th of August 2016 um, is the first bit of data. And it goes all the way, of course, now to today. That file is a, a 7.2 megabyte file. So it's got quite a bit of information in there, even though it's just text. And it shows, you know, when it started tracking to when it finished tracking. It's got, you know, all that information. So, yeah, you, if you want to be a data nerd and uh, see all that information, then uh, this is the way to do it. So, again, that's QS Access on the App Store. And like I said, it's available for free 
Uh, not sure again why it has three star ratings, except that maybe people wanted it to do more than just export CSVs. <laughs> they wanted stuff. to graph it too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if, so. if, if you if for the for the geeky and nerdy amongst us, uh, you know, you could roll your own. There is a py there are absolutely a Python library py py c CDA, uh, for instance, it will convert it into uh, the XML into uh, CSV. Oh, so you can easily write your own little. That's so funny that you, this is how I found QS access was, uh, I was wanting to see how I could read, uh, my, my CDA files. And I found those Python scripts oh, that yeah. documented online. Yeah. Uh, and then I found QS and I thought, okay, this is a little bit simpler. No, it's good. Uh, it's good. Learn. Yeah. You don't, I mean, you, if you're a coder, you can do it. Uh, mm -hmm. as soon as you said it's XML, I thought, oh, okay, well we can write a little, little utility yeah. to convert the XML to CSV. That's not so hard. Uh, you notice uh, I'm wearing a hat, and it makes me want to oh. say, how would you like a big Hawaiian punch? <laughs> I am wearing my Hawaiian punch hat. You are wearing, oh, my goodness. If that, only you, I had dreads. You need, yeah, you need to be, uh, you need to be filling that hat. <laughs> you look good in that. <laughs> uh, we are wearing silly hats, which you can't see if you're listening, but take take our word for it. I for, promise you we are wearing silly hats. I promise yeah. you we are. Uh, for one and only one reason, it's time for our app caps. Yes, yes. These are our picks of the week, the apps that we love to use and love to share with all of you. Hey, and you my app. that hat. I just love that on you. <laughs> I wish I should have pulled out my pirate wig that I have because it's basically dreads. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's to hold your dreads, to keep them up. For, yeah. Yeah, yeah man. Yeah. Um, so, so my app is uh, an app that's available in the App Store free with in-app purchases, and it is called Concepts. So last week, we talked about apps to use with your Apple Pencil, and I didn't bring up Concepts at the time, and I kind of wish I would have because I ended up reopening this app and I realized how awesome it is and how it is essentially the thing that I like to have, which is a an unlimited workspace on iOS. So let me switch my screens here so you can see. Uh, this is the sort of way that I chose to do it. I'm using the free version. This is not the pro version or anything like that. Uh, and I want to start by showing how you can change the grid form that you have here. So I could change it to dark print or brown. You know, I could change the type of paper, make it completely dark if I want to. I love dot grid. I don't know if you've noticed that about me, but I really love dot grid. Um, at 10, 100, 1664, and, and isometric, if you'd like to. Uh, there's scales, there's the type of units that you're using. So the iPad setting for inches, the point setting inches, millimeters, and a uh, specific unit. So this can get super in depth to create actual, you know, uh, drawn to scale measurements of, of items. This is a tool that can be used by uh, someone who's doing architectural drawings just as much as it can be used by someone who just wants to take notes on their device. And I'm going to change my, um, my iPad to that, that new form that we learned last week where you sort of slide your iPad in between the yeah, keyboard and I the trackpad. Yeah. Um, there are options for, you know, your, your Apple pencil or whatever stylus you happen to have. Uh, so that there's different pressure responses, uh, and you can change what your finger does based on what you do with the Apple pencil. And then what the double tap on the side does, uh, to change which mode. So in this case, it shows the color wheel and this is really cool, um, the gestures too, but this is really cool. When I tap, double tap that button, it will, well, maybe not. Oh wait, that's because I have this. Like, okay. Let me. Oh, if you'll forgive me, what yeah. is this for? <laughs> there we go. There we go. Now I Whoa! <laughs> yeah. So check out. All, so these are these are, these are like paint colors. chips. Yeah, these are actual colors that correspond to real colors in real life. So think about. So for me, I just like it as a an endless screen on which I can take notes. Or like I said, if I'm working on some sort of a woodworking project or something like that, and I want to do measurements and sketch out. Okay, you know, I need to have, and this is not precisely drawn, uh, but I need to have, you know, 12 two by fours, uh, and I can start to take measurements and set up exactly what I'm looking for. Again, horrible. So it's almost like a blueprint 
program kind of. It I can guess. be. Yeah. I mean, you can have it set up as a blueprint. You can have it just as your journal. Uh, okay, it's, it's up to you. Yeah. Yeah what you want to do with it. It's just a notebook, but it is a very well done notebook that can be a powerful tool for folks who are looking for something that's super precise. And so again, those Copic colors, think about a, an interior designer who is sketching out the the new layout for their living room, for someone's the client's living yeah, room. Yeah, you have to use real colors. You can't Exactly. Use... They correspond to actual yeah. swatches. And then yeah. check this out. The import option, uh, there are options for different symbols oh, that are oh, within oh, it. Oh, I like that. Do you have to but then do you have to pay for that? <laughs> those ones, yes. Those uh those some of the symbols you do pay for. Is that some of the Stephanie stuff is Stephanie from before. uh HR? <laughs> Check it out. It's Stephanie Studebaker. I can bring Stephanie into from the doc <laughs> from corporate exactly and start to uh, make some notes on Stephanie. So you look this starts to become a scrapbook. I like it that it has the predefined uh shapes. I think because I'm a terrible artist, as we've discussed, and uh, having those shapes means I can do, well, all sorts of stuff. Does it have, uh, oh, look at all of them. Does it have electronic symbols and things like that? Oh, These, big. I would guess I pay for, right? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, there's so, yeah, check this out. Yeah. See these? Yeah. 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 Your own so if you're doing you... circuit diagrams, that'd be great for program Ooh, flow. Oh, car. Oh, this is really cool. Some uh, UI stuff. Now, this is the cool thing about it, too. Oh, look, check that out. I can make a, an Apple Pencil. Let me see if I can sample it. Not Apple Pencil. Golly gee. Um, oh, I guess I can't drop it in. I just so want to see. So there are higher-end programs like this that a lot of pros use. Uh, oh, look at that. Wow. The golden ratio. Okay. Uh, now. There are two options in this. You can buy individual um, packs, but it also has a subscription option. Oh. And so by paying the subscription, then you get access to these different uh, tools and, and objects that are available in here. And they're always adding new uh, objects. And so, you know, you, you can oh, start to see some really different cool. options. How much is yeah. the uh, subscription? Uh, let's see. B -b -b I, might, I might use that. I might do that. That's pretty cool. The subscription is why don't I have it anymore? Um, let me pull up the the concepts thing. I thought I wrote that down, but I guess I didn't. Um, it is uh, seven ninety nine a month. Yes, but if you use this professionally, that'd be well well worth it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so this is, oh, and now you've seen my my private relay Apple ID uh, for this. But if, if folks are wondering what in the world that is, this has sign in with Apple, which is a way to set up individual accounts oh, for different apps. And so I've set up an individual account for this so that Stephanie Studebaker. Uh, Stephanie make, Studebaker can use it can to use it find that wily hacker. And the, <laughs> that well, it, there are lots of different options, of course, for changing the brushes. Uh, so, you know, you get the dynamic pen or the wire if you want. There's hard pencils and soft. I mean, it's got all your tools that you might want. Uh, and look, there even brush. there's a brush market if you want to add some different options there for pastels and pencil sketches. So if you think about this as an all-purpose all tool for every kind of artist or scrapbooker in my case, uh, then you can understand why someone might be interested in concepts. And in fact, the web page for uh, this, let me, let me go over here to the app store so you can kind of see one option for what this would be used for, uh, because I think it does give you a good idea of why someone would want to use concepts. Nice. So check this out. I mean, product design, yeah, um, sketching, cartooning, yeah, 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 Car yeah exactly. Uh, some illustrations, but as well as uh, fashion design. Oh uh, yeah, check that out products. Yeah. Uh, ooh, is that a new iPod or AirPod? And then here you go. This is what I was talking about before with architecture. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it can do things to scale. Oh, it's a ray gun. <laughs> <laughs> There are a lot of programs that do this, but this one is uh, more freeform than most. I like it. The infinite canvas. That's my big thing. That's, right. That is what I want more than – there are a lot of uh, sketchbook apps out there that don't have that option to just say, okay, I'm done with this. Let me move over to this next right. section. Okay, I'm done with that. Let it's me move over It's paginated section. or something. Yeah, this is just yeah. open. Yeah. As yes, it should exactly. be. Yeah. Oh, and, and it's got it layers, layers too. Nice. Concept. Yeah. 
I like concept. it. You can try it for free, so you get a really good sense of what's going on, and then buy yeah, what and you there's need. There's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot available for yeah. free in it, which yeah. is really great. Uh, and it continues. It's got a 4.7 rating and has maintained that high rating uh, for as long as it's been in the App Store. It's number 36 in graphics and design in the App Store. Well, so that's concepts. And what That's you concepts, got? man. Now Ma. we're gonna show you something really cool. Do you? <laughs> we a couple of weeks ago when we were actually it was last week, I guess we talked about brain programs. I mentioned uh, Sudoku, which is a great math app to to you know a math puzzle to get your your numbers side of your brain working. And I mentioned I use the uh, app from sudoku.com then i saw this and i don't know where i forgot where you did you do you like sudoku or you uh, i like crosswords but I'm yeah not you're more verbal that's why you should do it though because you got to expand your numbers that's then true. i saw this this was a viral video called the miracle sudoku it came from a channel called cracking the cryptic and this blew my mind. It's, it features Simon Anthony, who is a former UK team member on the Sudoku Championships. Okay. And he, this is, this is, it's making the rounds. Everybody's talking about it. It's called the Miracle Sudoku. I recommend it. I won't play it because it's a surprise. But he uses an app in there to solve his Sudokus. I thought, boy, I would love those features. Well, it turns out the cracking, the cryptic guys have made their own sudoku app it's called classic sudoku it's now it's one of those sideways things so i'm going to show you but i have to say they've done a really uh, good job now what it's five dollars and you get you don't get it like an infinite number of puzzles so it's a little pricey i just oh uh, and i guess they have they there's more puzzles that come out every week and stuff like that you get enough okay, puzzles good, good. but i i i think uh, that the solver, the, the tools they give you are so interesting. So uh, I've just started playing with this. Um, this is a puzzle by Thomas Snyder. He's Dr. Sudoku. He's the one-time world puzzle champion, three-time world Sudoku champion. And uh, and now, but un unlike the other Sudoku tools, you said you like the notes, but it has notes uh, in the corners. It has notes in the middle. It also has a very useful color feature. And this is what I saw them use on the Cracking the Cryptic. And I said, I have to have that. With this, you can color. For instance, let's see. If I'm saying I'm trying to figure out where all the ones might go. Well, there's a one is going to have to go uh, there. And it looks like because there's a one there, there's going to have to be a one there. And there's going to be a one maybe on these. You see, I'm coloring them as I go. I don't need one there, there, or there. And then uh, this means I, there can only be a one there. As you see, I'm solving the Sudoku. But what I'm actually doing is I'm just coloring squares to say uh, that, oh, this is where I can put my ones. Now, I've colored all the ones. I can, if I want now, just put the one in all of those squares, which makes that very easy. Oh. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, there's also some advantage to seeing the puzzle this way. It gives you ideas. For instance, I know one has to be in this column, right? So that would eliminate ones in other squares. It turns out I don't have to worry about that. But it, it gives you uh, additional features. There's additional buttons that are really great. This is the, the actual draw a one button. So we'll do that, put that in there. Um, it gives you lots of additional information. You have choices of colors in here. Undo. It's got a timer. You can get hints. Uh, I think this is kind of the, the Sudoku solver for people who are really serious about Sudoku. And I love it that it ties into the crap, cracking the cryptic channel where some of the smartest Sudoku uh, solvers exist. So I am going to now make this my pick for the best Sudoku game Wow! on the iPad, replacing Sudoku.com. I'm very fond of classic Sudoku. It is $5. It's not free. But watch, I'll tell you, if you start watching these guys working these puzzles on cracking the cryptic, you'll mm -hmm. start wanting to do it the way they do it. They are uh -huh. they are really good at it. This the and you if you haven't seen the miracle uh, Sudoku, 
Go see that on YouTube. It's 25 minutes well spent. It's a mind it boggler. And it may make you interested in the whole concept. And it's see, it, for me, it's uh, it's a reminder of my middle school talented and gifted classes that I, you know, yeah. those, those yeah. uh, where basically you'd start the day every day whenever you went to this class with Sudoku and then you do a uh, brain yeah, so training you and you do this and you do so that. You hate it. So it just kind of got grueling. You but hate it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, to me, Sudoku is not about uh, numbers. I think people think it's about numbers. It's not. There's no math involved at all. It's a logic puzzle. Right, exactly. And, and, yeah, and really, it tests your ability to make logical inferences from a situation. And so uh, it's about building logic. I think it's really uh, fun. It isn't, you know, don't worry, there's no math involved. But honestly, if you want to get excited about Sudoku, I, w Sudoku, I would go to uh, uh, Cracking the Cryptic and, and watch that one on the, on the miracle Sudoku puzzle because, wow. <laughs> wow. Then you'll have an appreciation for the whole thing. Um, that is it <clears throat> for iOS today. Why do I always pick hats I can't wear headphones with? <laughs> you know, there's something there. I do like this hat, though. I might wear it for the rest of the day. There you go. How would you like I a like big Hawaiian too. punch? Boing! Ah, you're going to get it. <laughs> you're going to hear about it. Does that, oh, could did you... you ever see those ads or is, those, is that really old? Oh, no, I remember those. You yeah. do? Okay. Whew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes. I don't know. Does Hawaiian punch still exist? I hope not. It's I think not it was good just sugar and red <laughs> red food coloring. It's expensive, <laughs> it's expensive Kool Aid. Yeah. So anyway, uh, but it does. It's delicious. It's delicious. Yeah. It's it delicious. did taste good. It's delicious. Mm. I got to say that. I got to say it's I gotta delicious. Say it. Micah Sargent oh, is the host delicious. of uh, Smart Tech Today with Matthew Castanelli and of Tech News Weekly with our friend Jason Howell and, and of course, the host of Hands iOS, on iOS today. Oh, and I forgot Hands on iOS, where you do a lot of, I feel like now I'm just going to be the dummy on this show and you can show me how to do everything. Cause uh, I'm going to be doing an episode on uh, the contact tracing stuff soon. Uh, so it'll be interesting. See if you can get an app. Find an app that yes, works. Yes, exactly. With. That yeah, is exactly yeah. what I'm in the in the look, look on the lookout for. So it'll be we next. do iOS today every Tuesday, 9 a.m. Pacific. That's noon Eastern time. That's 1600 UTC. If you want to watch or listen live, you can go to twittv slash live or ask your device. Let me see if I can get my device over here and say, "Hey, device, <laughs> play Twit Live." And sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. <laughs> That's just the way these devices are. By the way, you can also ask it to play any podcast. You could say, hey, device, play iOS Today podcast and listen to the most recent episode, which won't be today's yet. We first right. we have to edit it a lot. And yes. then we'll put it out. When we do put it out, it'll be available at the website, twit.tv slash iOS. There's also By the way, the mic is on mute. I, to turn I, it back on, I, press the button on I, the back of Google I, Home. I know. Thank you. <laughs> what does mute love, mean? Tell me yeah. what it means. It means shut up. <laughs> How does it know that you were talking to it? By the way, oh, helpful little that's... bugger. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's gotten to that point, isn't it? At first, these were little miracles that you could talk to and then answer. But it didn't take long before we started to go, you jerk, shut up. Yeah. Stop talking. Stop talking. I'm working here. <laughs> I'm, you can find us on, on YouTube. Best thing to do, though, get a uh, podcast application and subscribe. And yes, I know Joe Rogan got $100 million to be on Spotify. We're on it for free. So <laughs> you can listen there. You can listen on TuneIn. You can listen on Stitcher and Slacker. Pocket Cast, Overcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. We're everywhere. Just cast, find a cast. podcast app. Yes. On Joe's little podcast app, whatever it is, find iOS today. Press the subscribe button. It costs you nothing. That way it'll automatically download it. It's even better than YouTube. It'll actually download it and it'll be there. And you could be in the middle of nowhere and you just press play and we'll play for you. Audio mm -hmm. or video, you get the choice. Now, Micah. I loved it that we got a video. How can people send us Me their too. video questions? Yeah, you send that to iOS today at twit.tv. There's some debate in the chat room, irc.twit.tv, whether that was a fountain in the background <clears throat> or whether the dog came in and started drinking its water. <laughs> oh, that's not a bad option. If we were a really yeah. big dog, it might have sounded like a fountain. It could also have been a yeah, like a cat fountain. 
It could have been any number of things. We may this never is know. true. They, Send us your video. We'll be talking about enough. you like this next time. <laughs> <laughs> On iOS Today. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Mikey. Hey, folks, it's Micah Sargent here, co-host of Smart Tech Today, right here on twit.tv. Every single week, Matthew Casanelli and I sit down to talk about smart tech for the week. That's right. It can get kind of complicated, but there's a lot of news out there. There's a lot of products to dig through. There are a lot of questions to answer, and we try to do that all every single week. From voice assistants to wearables to smart garage door openers and lights, there's so much to cover and, well, so little time. So be sure to check it out. It's twit.tv slash STT. Oh, that rhymes.